So to get to our speakers, it's my pleasure to introduce Seth Crompton. Uh, for the better part of his career, Seth has served in varying leadership capacities in mass actions and class actions throughout the United States and also here locally. His results have been recognized by the judiciary and his peers, and he has amassed a significant number of other awards and recognition, none of which his children actually care about, uh, as he, he says they're mostly concerned with video games and sports, as we can all relate to in these days of house arrest and lots of time with our children. Uh, as for Patrick Dowd, uh, Pat is an attorney at the Holland Law Firm also, and he practices plaintiff civil litigation. He's been actively involved in several mass tort litigations, such as Granuflow, Marina, Talcum Powder, Roundup, and 3M. So thank you both very much for agreeing to speak for us today. We appreciate it, and I will hand it over to you. Uh, this is Seth, and uh, thank you to Jen and Alaris for having Patrick and I to uh, present this, and thank you for everybody for getting on. Um, we're obviously in a kind of a brave new world doing things uh, virtual that we'd never do before. Um, in fact, we've even done some mediations that have went uh, pretty well. But hopefully uh, this can go pretty smooth and Patrick and I can pull this off. Uh, I would say that uh, some of this might be, uh, we try to get into some nitty gritty on some stuff and then on others, it's a little bit of high level. Um, so if you have any further follow-up questions or issues other than the question answer session here for something you wanna speak to us privately about, uh, Patrick or I are obviously happy to speak to anyone separately at a different time, different day. Um, so, to get this started, uh, obviously we're talking about mass torts, and mass, the, the early days of mass torts were driven by first by asbestos litigation. I mean, most people who live or work, I guess, in our metro area certainly have heard of the asbestos litigation on both sides of the river. And, and the one thing that the asbestos litigation started was that everyone, each plaintiff would file their own suit and they would file it against multiple defendants. Well, over time, these defendants we're having to repeatedly produce the same sort of documents and information to each plaintiff uh, repeatedly, which it, it, at some point there had to be some efficiency to that. So oftentimes there were repositories set up uh, with the court or with other vendors, for instance, where these documents could be obtained and the defendants would just say, see uh, repository. Um, that, that asbestos litigation really came into vogue in the 80s and then in the 90s, uh, the breast implant litigation uh, came about where it was, again, there was an FDA warning that came out and a bunch of uh, women filed suit. There was also class action lawsuits, which we'll get to uh, as a little bit of difference between class actions and mass torts, uh, brought suit uh, because of the concern uh, of their breast implants. And uh, while that has been the subject of some much maligned uh, back and forth scholarly articles over the years. It started to set the stage for the mass torts that uh, we see today. And similar to that, there's mass disaster cases. Uh, most of us have heard of the Exxon Valdez case, uh, which I think occurred in about 1989. And from that case, there were claims for about 32,000 fishermen, Alaska natives, landowners, and other people, as well as, of course, governmental entities as kind of a uh, crazy note, I guess. Interestingly, that litigation was uh, not on behalf of individuals, but on behalf of the government entities who settled in 1991. That case was actually finally brought to a close in its very end in uh, federal court in Alaska in 2015. So that was uh, quite a lengthy litigation. Um, but anyway, so again, those kind of set the, set the, uh, the basis for it. And then in, in the late 1990s, uh, lawsuits arose from a drug called FenFen. FenFen was touted as a miracle drug for obesity, and there were about 18 million prescriptions written from that. And in 1997, it was removed from the market uh, due to studies linking it to heart valve damage. And from that, uh, uh, there were about 11,000 claims. And that's uh, about the time that attorneys, uh, mostly plaintiff's attorneys, of course, began uh, to see a model to aggregate pharmaceutical cases. And as we'll see, that's expanded to some things outside of pharmaceutical, but it started to be able to represent mass people and bring uh, cases and justice on behalf of those people who suffered similar type of damages uh, from a drug or device or sometimes some agricultural cases. Um, and then after FinFin, the Vioxx trials, and Vioxx, just so you know, was, uh, uh, there were some serious uh, 
known risks of heart problems, cardiovascular events, and even death that were known at the time Biox was released, that were not, or they were known by the pharmaceutical company, but they were not released to the public. From that, there were several very, very large uh, blockbuster verdicts against Biox uh, because of the fact the company knew that this could happen and went ahead and released the drug anyway. And that's when, uh, that's when people really, there were about 30,000 claims in the Biox case, and that's when people um, started, uh, you know, really started to take notice that these, these cases can be aggregated and that there are business models and litigation models to do these together. Because the fact of the matter exists that to do a one-off uh, mass tort case against a very well-funded uh, pharmaceutical company is, is, is difficult if not impossible, and basically you, you, you bankrupt yourself trying to do it. So we first start with, and I'm gonna, Patrick and I are gonna go back and forth. I just wanted to do the kind of introduction part. Uh, I'm gonna talk about class action versus mass torts, and then uh, Patrick will jump in on the next part. And like I said, we'll go back and forth throughout this. So uh, one question that I get, especially from people who may not do these all the time, is what's the difference in a class action and a mass tort? So class action are cases where essentially one or two people represent a class of, uh, of users or consumers. And for the most part, they all get the same. They have pretty much the same exact damages. And if resolved, they end up with the same type of relief. So uh, probably the most typical example of that is a few years back, there was a whole slew of cases for bank overcharges. And basically what the bank was doing was uh, using an algorithm to say if you only had a hundred dollars in in your uh, in your bank account and you bought three things for thirty dollars and then one thing for fifty, logic would say, okay, well the three things for thirty were covered, but the one for fifty kicked me over, so I have to pay one overdraft fee and one penalty. Well, what the banks were doing was essentially reallocating your uh, uh, purchases, if you will, to basically take the the, the larger ones off top which then on the back end would generate more overdrafts and overdraft fees. And so essentially that's the kind of case where everyone suffered the same type of damage, meaning the overdraft fees were fairly uniform, um, obviously varied amongst banks, but they were fairly uniform and they suffered the same types of damages uh, based on the same conduct. A mass tort on the other hand, uh, it is, is something that's more uh, akin to a personal injury case or a mass disaster because personal injury cases cannot be done, I think in all 50 states at this point as a class action. They have to be done as a mass, which basically means each case rises and falls on its own merits. Now, while of course there's discovery that happens across the board that is beneficial for everybody, you know, just because for instance, you had a heart attack from Vioxx does not mean you got the same exact amount of money that somebody else did that had a heart, heart attack from Vioxx. And so each case sort of rises and falls on its own merits. So Patrick, uh, with that said, will you give us some examples, of some mass torts we worked on and you work on and that you know of? Yeah, so uh, like the PowerPoint shows, there, there are various different types of mass torts. Uh, medical drug would be like a Vioxx example. A device would be like a, the infused spinal device that is implanted in your back. Um, and then other products would be like the talcum powder and the Roundup litigations. For all of these cases, uh, the joinder rules in your state are really the ones that are going to uh, create the avenue to, to set up a mass tort action in state court. So you know that joinder is in Missouri, you can join in one action if you have a common question of law or fact, uh, and it arose out of the same or similar transactions or occurrences. So you have a group of people injured by the same product. Usually it's the same defendant, liability is similar, and the same diagnosis. So you plead that together uh, and then move for joinder. Uh, keeping it under 100 uh, people in a petition will uh, avoid the ability for the defendants to remove it uh, to federal court under CAFA. But that is typically how they're all joined together in, in one petition um, and, and arising out of the same common scheme or, or occurrences. Uh, and so keep in mind though that in, in Missouri, they recently have passed a new statute um, 
uh, it's Senate Bill 50. I don't know the site other than that, um, but it is effectively going to try to cut away at Joinder for product defect cases, although there hasn't been any sort of challenge that I'm aware of yet to that statute. Hey, thanks, Patrick. And also, while, while we're here, just before we kind of get into the meat of this, for background, um, why don't you let everybody know, uh, you know, what a uh, MDL is and how that sort of uh, these cases are aggregated by something called the Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation in Federal Court. Yeah, so M MDL is set up uh, as sort of kind of a centralized federal court. There's one MDL set up for each mass tort, and it's essentially if a case is a mass tort case is going to be litigated in any sort of federal court, as opposed to you know everybody filing them all across the country in different federal courts. This one centralized multi-district litigation federal court is set up so that all federal cases can be filed and funneled into that court. Um, and so the federal MDL is something that kind of tracks on its own uh, and as opposed to the state mass tort cases that kind of work off their own track. So federal MDL is, is separate from the state court uh, mass tort actions. We do our best for the most part to keep our cases in uh, like a Missouri state court uh, for the mass torts, but uh, in the event the case is removed to federal court, they will all pretty much be sucked up into the federal MDL. All right, thank you. So, all right, so let's uh, get in the main question here, which is, well, how do you do this? So you can go to any number of seminars, uh, uh, the American Association for Justice puts one on, Mass Torts Made Perfect puts one on, Harris Martin is another vendor. Um, it, you go there and uh, my, my, my joke, I guess, for not really funny, but the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, they're, they're selling you um, uh, the drill, but not the drill bits. And, um, and while you're there, you're basically going to be presented with a bunch of opportunities. Uh, people will talk to you to try to get them to refer your case refer them to cases you have, or you're going to partner up with them to uh, work on the cases together, or many times uh, joint ventures, and these come in a variety of forms, but a lot of these are based off of many of the vendors there, uh, uh, some of which are very good vendors. They sell different kinds of things. They sell leads, meaning uh, this could be a case. They, they, have, they help you with marketing, uh, to get more certain of a case. And then some of these vendors have partners with law firms and they, you know, and, and they kind of structure different deals uh, and all of this. And it's kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, it's a little bit convoluted and it can be a little bit of a mess, but it is, it is good to get some information with those uh, to see what's going on, uh, what are the new cases. Um, you don't tend to get a lot of the uh, bad sides of the cases unless you're you're talking to the right people on those but you know you're going to be offered a lot of um, you, you could be offered a lot of opportunities there and sometimes some of those people are very good and do upstanding business and other times it's uh, sort of buyer beware uh, but that's what it you know that's kind of that's some people just think all right I'm just going to go there and show up and I'll figure this out and start doing uh, start doing math towards and I, I would caution you that it's certainly good information, but you need a little bit of uh, idea of what you're doing before you get there. So the next slide then is, you know, we're gonna ask, is there a more sensible way for you to do these type of cases or to get involved? And involvement looks works in different ways. Uh, involvement, some people uh, are passive investors, meaning that they have some money from their practice and they wanna invest in something that they know or a field that they're comfortable in but they want to work with a law firm that has done these before, knows the landscape, knows the other lawyers and those kind of things. Other people want to plunge in head, uh, head first and see what happens. Um, and other people want to kind of do mix those two is get involved, but also do some work on the case. So I don't think there's a cookie cutter approach, but I do think we have some kind of guidelines for how uh, you might want to do it. And I would encourage everybody uh, before you just, jump in head first to, to talk to people, get some information. Um, like I said, Patrick and I are always here to talk to people and um, some cases are good, some cases are bad. Um, some lawyers are good to work with, some lawyers are bad to work with. So there's a whole, there's a whole minefield to this, but do your homework is the number one thing. So 
as far as getting in cases, um, uh, getting cases, first suggestion, you know, I would say get something that you might, if you're just getting started, something you might not know about for a unique reason. Um, meaning that perhaps you have a personal interest or you've had some life experience with something, maybe uh, you had family farms or something like that. And, and, and you kind of actually know about uh, Monsanto's operations and glyphosate and things like that. And that, and that not only piques your interest, but you have some, uh, but you, but you have some background to look into that and see what's the good science, or maybe you you have some sort of a medical background and you you think that a couple of these science cases may appeal to that interest. Um, but uh, you know, so so you know, find find your reason for looking at some of these cases, and and it's something that you're going to have to study and you're going to have to be interested in. Take a look, um, and I'll let Patrick kind of uh, speak to the next two, and then we'll then we'll move on to some more practical stuff. Yeah, thanks, Seth. So, uh, know the lawyers who are taking the lead in the litigation. Um, what you don't want to do is to end up on your own island by yourself. Uh, these pharma defendants have a tendency to resolve and take out the leaders of the litigation first who have the largest inventories. Um, and so you want to try to link up with, with one of them if, if you're looking to try to get some sort of a settlement, um, you know, a reasonable settlement sooner than, than waiting to the last minute. Um, you know, unless you're prepared for a long drawn out fight, you don't really want to be the last one standing with cases that haven't been settled. Um, the, in terms of having a solid inventory, again, that's going to depend on what, what you want your role to be. Uh, you can be passive wherein you're just collecting cases and referring them out. Uh, to other lawyers that are litigating the case, or you, you can take a more active role and, and collect cases and ask other firms for their cases, and you can just litigate the cases uh, as opposed to just referring them out. Um, but to do that, you want to get an idea as to how much is it going to cost you to collect a single case? What kind of advertisements are you going to do? Are you going to hire somebody else to do the ads and then you know, have them refer you their cases? Um, what's it going to cost to, to get the medical records in? There's obviously been some changes to the High Tech Act, which is making it a little bit more difficult to get medical records cheap nowadays. So that's something to factor into, you know, your overall homework approach before diving in is how much is it going to cost? Um, you know, realizing that, you know, it can take five, 10 or plus years to get any sort of recovery. So all of these things are, are, are stuff like Seth said to do on the front end as opposed to just you know, learning as you go. Uh, so the other thing about it, having an inventory is you wanna make sure it's the right inventory and you don't wanna collect cases just because you wanna have an, a big number because at the end of the day, not every case is gonna pay out, which we'll talk about in a second, but uh, just another thing to keep in mind that the quality of the inventory is most important over the, the quantity that you have. I would uh, agree with that. I would agree with that. Um, Move it on to our next slide here. Uh, mining your gold mine. Uh, you know, I oftentimes when we started with going to these different seminars and talking to people, but a lot of times you'd be surprised, even if your practice area is not necessarily personal injury, how many types of uh, cases that you have or contacts in your type of practice that might uh, could use your services in helping them out in this area or getting them linked up with a firm that's working. And I'm gonna give you a few examples. Um, but you know, number one, it, it, it's it's overlooked. Everyone thinks, okay, I see all these advertisements for you know we're bombarded with. Them. I mean, you sit in any doctor's office uh, in the middle of the day, um, or you know, a lot of us are stuck at home now, and you know, occasionally turn the TV on or something. I mean, it, it is bombarded with legal ads and you think well how in the world am i going to get those um, and so the first avenue is uh, obtaining your cases from your clients past and current uh, you know we we uh, try to keep ways we keep track of all of our clients um, and i would encourage you to do so if you're not doing that and have ways to communicate uh, information to them going forward so that number one um, you're always on their mind uh, and number two uh, you have something you're specifically reaching out for um, that could be a benefit to them you you have a way to do so and it's probably not going to cost you much to 
uh, email or send a flyer to your existing clients. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples that kind of goes into the third point here uh, on the slide about what kind of law do you practice and what other issues do those clientele have in life. Uh, for instance, uh, we've done some hip cases over the years, some hip, uh, hip device malfunction cases, and there were a couple of lawyers who did a good amount of elder law and estate law. And you would think, well, what in the world, how, how, how do they get to um, having hip cases but believe it or not, because they had older clients and that hip replacements tend to be in older people, uh, they were actually able to amass a nice uh, inventory of hip cases by just simply contacting their own clients uh, in a very efficient, economical manner and uh, were able to you know, work, with, work with us and uh, obtain uh, a nice fee on a lot of those cases. Um, once they resolved uh, from simply mi mining their own inventory and, and, and just keep keeping contacts with people they had. Um, similar, um, there's been a lot of litigation on different birth control devices, Escher being one is a permanent device, Mirena being another. Uh, the Mirena litigation is actually closed. It did not turn out very well for the plaintiffs, but nevertheless, the point is, um, you know, if, if you primarily uh, perhaps practice uh, in uh, an area that uh, where you deal with, we deal with a lot of women, for instance, um, there, there are a lot of women products and devices out there that are subject of litigation. And again, you, you might be sitting on uh, some clients that you don't even think about in, in, in that way in your own, in your normal course of practice, because that, again, you're not looking for these kind of things. So uh, Patrick, anything to add on that? I mean, just don't, you know, sometimes it takes just uh, going to the conferences and, and selling yourself. A lot of times you'll go to them, uh, the conferences, and you'll hear of, you know, other firms saying, I got an inventory of a couple hundred or, you know, a thousand or whatever. And, you know, I'm looking to refer them out to somebody. And, you know, you, you got to be in a position to, to sell yourself as to why they should send their cases to you. So uh, at the end of it, a lot of it is selling your practice and selling yourself as you should send me your cases as opposed to sending them else and, and here's why. Here's why I have a, a niche in either the law in this area or the courthouse or or, or something that, that shows that you have a benefit over somebody else because and there's a lot of firms out there that are going to be asking around to, to collect people's inventories and, and you want to set yourself apart and show why why they should send the cases to you. So uh, going to those and then and, and going through the the circuit of um, you know conferences is is something that kind of part and parcel with it just to make sure that you know everybody remembers you and, and sees your face and keeps you in mind in the event they get cases in the future. Yeah Patrick and we you know we've partnered with a number of firms who you know for instance uh, there's a, a firm out of New York that's a, a very well known uh, in the area their car accident firm. Uh, they do a ton of local advertising and they do a uh, ton of, you know, they have a ton of clients. They, they you know, they run a, a sort of a mass volume practice in that regard. And, you know, they, they, we worked with them on several different litigations and getting, uh, you know, they, they sent out uh, information to their existing uh, or prior and current clients. And they weren't looking to litigate the cases because it's just, it's just not what they do. But they, they were looking to get involved in that way. So, you know, I, I mean, the point of all that is, is you got to think about what you do and um, uh, you know what 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 you are doing uh, could translate to something else. Um, so, anyways, which sort of moves us on to the next slide, and I'll take number one. It's you know who are you? And again, we Patrick and I have mentioned this a couple times. There's there's many different ways to enter. Uh, this area of practice. Um, it's a very, I would say, entrepreneurial area, and uh, um, a lot of people have creative ideas and have got in doing different ways and different things, and there's, there's no cookie cutter route. It's sort of up to you, but you do need to kind of figure out who you are and what you want out of this. Um, what do you want short term from this? What do you want uh, long term from this? Meaning, is this you know how, how are you are you looking at this as an investment of a possible return? Are you looking to really litigate these cases, or you know, um, you know again, or what are you trying to do with this? And I think that'll help guide your marketing and 
how you become involved in this when you kind of figure out how the angle that you want to play. So um, that said, uh, back to Patrick, do you want to, you want to knock out a couple of these here? Sure. The two, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, just the idea that you know, don't stop your normal practice and, and invest all your money and, and, and time into a, a single mass tort because uh, they can go up and smoke pretty quick. Uh, Seth referenced Mirena. Um, and that was a case that we got a bad Daubert ruling in the MDL and uh, that kind of had the writing written on the wall and uh, the litigation pretty much ended pretty quickly after that. So it just takes a couple bad rulings uh, for the, the litigation to, to kind of turn the tide and go the other way. So just uh, a tip of, the, you want to get involved, you know, great, but, you know, realize there's some significant risks, which is kind of talked about the next one is, these can go bad, um, and, and if they go bad, obviously it's a big investment. Um, so just something to keep in mind when you're evaluating: Do I want to get into it? You know, plug it into the calculation. Is it worth it? Um, and again, it ties into the the number four too. That it's going to cost a lot of time and money to to work cases up in a mass tort setting. Um, so again, all that has to be factored into to the calculation. And you know you got to be prepared for a five, ten year battle uh, with with potentially no recoveries in the mass tort world during that time. Um, you can go to the next slide, Seth. Yeah, sure. I, I'm, just to follow up on a couple of those, all all good points, Patrick. Look, the, as we have kind of bold or you know in capital letters, there no claim is perfect. I I can't tell you the number of times where you think, oh my gosh, you see this the FDA has pulled something from the market or uh, something like that that you think, okay, this, this is a home run, this is a game winner, there's absolutely no way this doesn't uh, settle. In the case for a different variety of reasons, which I won't get into um, uh, today, um, any number of cases can have, uh, can go backwards. But you know, on the same token, the other side of that is is some of these cases go well, and and when they go well, they tend to go really well. Um, so it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. Some, you know, a lot of people diversify, and they have, uh, you know, they're not just all in on one uh, mass tort. Uh, some people, when they're investing in them, especially for those of us who actually work on them, um, we certainly work on multiple of them because over the years, and they're uh, things. It's like I said, it's a bit of a ro roller coaster, and a lot of times, some things are out of your control. There could be um, a decision that comes out that affects where your cases can be filed or the value of them, uh, either positively or negatively. And that, unfortunately, isn't totally in your control sometimes because other people are litigating these too. So they're risky, but at the same time, um, you know, there are some, some benefits and it's why so many uh, people invest and work in this space because there are, there are some uh, some benefits in some cases uh, have went really well, and they should have, frankly, went really well. It's a lot of times, you know, we'll find uh, some pretty egregious conduct uh, in the documents and the depositions. And some of those cases, when you hear about those big verdicts, uh, I can tell you that um, any of the big verdicts that we've been involved in, uh, either directly or uh, sort of collaterally, um, are all, in my, in my perspective, it's not some sympathetic, we feel bad because the plaintiff has cancer. It's because, frankly, the internal documents are really bad uh, for the defendant. And there was a lot of knowledge of things that were going on and the risks and the causes and, the, and things these drugs or devices could have caused. And, um, you know, and, and they knew about it and didn't do anything about it. And so, you know, like I said, there, there's always good, there's always upside, but there's certainly downside to this. It's no, you know, it's, it's, no, uh, it's no guarantee of any payment, but, you know, you work hard, uh, you work with the right people, you choose right. Uh, it, it's a good avenue to either get involved in or supplement your practice, especially, uh, like I mentioned, if your practice doesn't necessarily involve this every day, but you have that for some relatively low risk and overhead, uh, can get involved in a few of these. So, but again, like any lawsuit, um, it, it's an uncertain outcome on our side. We don't, uh, the plan as far as uh, most of you uh, know, one way or the other, do not work on an hourly basis. There's no guaranteed fee. So, you know, we try to be uh, choosy on our projects and, um, you know, we try to work them up the right way. 
So, which kind of moves into slide five, which I'll keep going and then let Patrick step in after that. Um, you know, you got to reevaluate your cases and where you're, uh, your, you know, where you're spending some of your marketing and your time because the legal landscape shifts. Um, some cases uh, seem like they're going to work out and they don't. There's bankruptcies. Um, and then some cases, weirdly enough, don't seem to be going anywhere, they seem to be struggling, chugging along. And then all of a sudden, um, something comes out and it changes, it changes the game and it becomes very, very, uh, uh, a very strong litigation. I mean, Actos is probably my uh, best example of that. Uh, Actos is a drug that uh, was linked to causing bladder cancer. And for a long time, uh, those cases were consolidated in Louisiana. They weren't necessarily going anywhere. Uh, and I shouldn't say that. They weren't, they were, go, they, they were, it was a slow slog and there certainly wasn't any sort of uh, uh, smoking guns or anything like that coming out. It was just sort of, it was a slow slog and it was a tough, very, very tough litigation. And then along the way, they figured out that a ton of documents, um, which were actually obtained through third party uh, uh, companies, uh, which had basically warned of this problem, were actually destroyed by the company. And that literally changed the game on, on, on those cases. And um, that resulted in a very, very large verdict and a, and, and, and a nationwide settlement. So again, the legal landscape changes for both good and for bad. But um, as far as, again, the next kind of three slides deal with some of the, some of the work you need to do personally. So Patrick, was, could you talk about those? Sure. These these three are obviously very critical of keeping everything organized, making sure you have the correct information that you need, and screening the cases uh, are, are very, very critical. Like I said earlier, you can have a significantly large inventory, but if it's bad and it's not the right cancer or, or people aren't giving you the correct information, at the end of the day, you, you, you're going to waste a lot of your time and money because those cases aren't going to pay out at the end. Um, so researching, again, you're doing the homework in terms of liability, damages, and causation uh, is really critical in terms of what do you need for your initial intake paperwork. So, you know, we always send clients at the outset uh, a very short, you know, page, two, three pages of intake of uh, certain questions that we need to answer in order to determine if we think their case is going to qualify. And so you obviously need to put on there the things that, that you think are going to be relevant at the end of the litigation to make the case on liability and damages. Um, and so, you know, doing all this at the outset is really going uh, to frame what you include in your intake paperwork. And it's, it's a work in progress. We're constantly changing our intake paperwork so that we get you know, more accurate information or more specific information. Um, because again, at the end of the day, the intake, uh, you know, questionnaires and the medical records may be the only things you know about the client. And so the, the accuracy of that information is going to be vital at the end of the case. And once you have a collection of your inventory, you got to go back and, and go through it and see what's missing, see what doesn't make sense. Uh, and see what additional information you need because if you leave it all to the end, it's, it's just a, a mad scramble and it's not workable. Um, so, you know, for instance, if, if you have a one-off case and, and you need uh, to contact them and ask them, oh, what was that doctor you saw, you know, in 2019 or 2018? It's something that's fairly easy to do, but when you're doing it with a hundred or a thousand people, uh, that, that carries a lot more, uh, obviously, internal problems in terms of your staff handling the phone calls. You'll leave messages, so they're going to call back. You need to make sure your staff knows how to answer them. So having a solid intake sheet and questionnaire is really, really important and, and really going to be something that, that helps you throughout the litigation. Yeah, thank you, Pat Patrick. And just to expand on that a little bit, um, you, we here, you know, and I, I guess I can only speak to how we do it as far as our kind of organization goes. Um, you know, we have a sort of a very deliberate and dedicated process and procedures, both internally and externally on how we do this. Um, internally, meaning 
how it goes from, from intake to entry in the system to uh, the information obtained, the spreadsheet, who handles it, and, and all of these kind of information. Um, it's, it's very deliberate in how we do it because you've got to stay organized dealing with as many clients. Um, and to Patrick's point, you know, if you got problems, you want to know that as with any case, we all want to know that on the front end. And that's certainly no different here. And you also want to, you know, make sure that you're getting the right kind of cases in that, that people have actual exposure and actual injuries. Um, certainly some of those slip through. So you want to make sure you're getting them out. We do a very uh, cognizant job of, of, of turning down many cases that we don't think that, uh, you know, or the right case for us to handle. And as part of that, figuring out the right case for us to handle is kind of the correct information is key. Again, I've said it once, I've said it 10 times probably on this presentation, to everyone will listen, the landscape shifts and you have to keep up to date with the information or at least be aligned with someone who is keeping up to date on the information because uh, you never know what's around the corner on these types of cases. And um, and part of that is, as I mentioned a minute ago, your sort of external alliances. We worked with some amazing firms and partners, and we worked with some not so amazing firms and partners. And um, I can tell you, it's way easier to work with the amazing ones. Um, but you know, it, it's it's good information that goes both ways. And um, like I said, we're very deliberate in who we work with. And uh, you know, and part of that is because we have to have our procedures and part of that is meaning we have to get the right information to make decisions all of the time. So it's important, uh, yeah, it's important to keep on top of that and to keep on top of your cases. And keeping on top of your cases, uh, moving on to the next slide, um, uh, you know, servicing your cases is critical. You, either you're servicing them, uh, meaning you've got them in-house at your firm, or you're working with a firm that, that's servicing the, the cases. And again, um, it, it really comes down, to make sure the firm you're working with is very organized and how they do things. They're, we're gonna talk about uh, a few things on this slide uh, that you know, can lead to some uh, client problems uh, if you're not organized, because these, these require constant work. You don't just get them in and wait around for your paycheck to come. There, there's a lot of constant work, a lot of staff work and lawyer work that's involved in these. So Patrick, you wanna, Start on yeah. the slide. Sure. Um, I think client communication and managing their expectations from the outset is really, really important. Uh, you want to just flat out tell them, look, this is going to take, you know, upwards of five to, to seven years. You want to get that out in the in the early portion of it so that they know what to expect. Um, you know, you're going to have again a significant number of clients, and uh, for the most part, in the litigations I've worked in. Uh, throughout the time you're, you're litigating your cases, the clients are going to hear about these huge massive verdicts that have come out of these various states um, in cases involving the drugs that, that they've taken. And, you know, it's like clockwork. The next day you're going to get calls, you know, hey, where's my, you know, where's my money? I just saw this person got, you know, $70 million. I, where's my money? Um, so, you know, you need to make sure that your staff is prepared to handle those types of calls to address them. Um, but it all goes back to managing the client's expectations and, and, and more so reassuring the clients that, you know, even if there are long periods of times where they don't necessarily hear from you, you are still working on, on their case. Uh, clients want reassurance that, that you're their lawyer and, and that you are spending a, a significant amount of time working on their case and they need to be reassured of that. So making sure that, that you have, you know, client expectations managed from the outset, um, you know, responding to all their calls and, and obviously emails um, is something that, that, you know, it's the most you can do while there's nothing significant happening in their particular case. Um, in terms of evaluation of the statute of limitation and applicable, applicable laws, uh, that's the situation to where, you know, for instance, if the case is filed in, in Missouri, but the client lives in a different state, uh, you got to figure out which state's law is going to apply to which particular issue. So for statute of limitation, it's generally the law of that person's home state that's going to govern that, that issue. Um, but for most other issues, uh, there is no bright line rule in Missouri. It's determined by the most significant relationship test. 
which is an issue by issue uh, analysis of which state has the more significant interest or relationship to this particular issue. So for an example and, and roundup, uh, let's say we're talking about the issue of liability and state X has a different negligence standard than Missouri, uh, which state's negligence standard is going to apply? Well, we would argue that M Missouri has a more significant interest in liability for that particular issue because Monsanto is located in Missouri and Missouri has a significant interest in controlling the conduct of its corporate citizens. So that's an example of one to where uh, Missouri law, we would argue, would apply because it has a greater interest than some other random state that the person's living in. Uh, again, it's a case-by-case -case analysis, um, but it is something that's important to, to consider, especially when you're deciding, uh, if, it, if it comes to it, which cases of yours are trial cases. Uh, you want to make sure that you have the best trial cases, uh, not just the facts, but the law, too. You want to, you know, check, are there are there caps on the punitive damages in this particular person's state? Uh, what do the, the negligence standards look like? All those things you know, need to be evaluated when you're trying to decide who is a good trial pick case. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. And I, I would um, reiterate the point on the uh, communications. Look, you know, we, we are, again, we have process and procedures for this. And the last thing you want to do is, <laughs> You know, a lot of work might have been done on their case and a lot of work, perhaps not even in their direct case. Two years later, you say, hey, look, I think we're getting close to resolution. Here's where we're at. And they're going to say, well, what in the world? I haven't heard a thing from you. So we we try to regularly uh, communicate. Some of these are admittedly some uh, mass type communications. But uh, we found that when you're dealing with the volume of clients, that, that some form of regular communication, you're always going to have people who call, but some form of regular communication uh, it is going to really help your staff be more efficient so that they're not, you know, chasing, chasing things every day or trying to get caught up on calls, especially as Patrick mentioned, when there's public information that comes out, phone starts ringing off the hook. So um, one, you obviously want to know about the public information, uh, but two, a lot of times some of this, uh, you know, if you're in the information pipeline, is not new news and you can, you can sort of have a proactive plan to, to deal with that. So anyway, so we've kind of, uh, moving on, we've kind of indirectly touched upon uh, some ethical issues that come up from time to time. Uh, we're in the next few slides, we're gonna spend on those and then close out and maybe take a few questions if we have a few minutes. Um, so on, on, on the first rule we're gonna talk about is a uh, client with diminished capacity. Um, but well, before I say that, we have, uh, in these types of cases, uh, ethical issues come up all the time that are completely unforeseen. Uh, we're fortunate that we consult with a uh, professor um, uh, at one of the universities here who, who is very good uh, in getting uh, not only uh, the right answer, but doing it efficiently and, uh, you know, helping us work through issues. And these come up all the time. And so, you know, it's, if you start to do this, you want to have you know, some resources because things come up, very unexpected, very odd conflict issues, other council issues, uh, things like that from time to time. So it's, it's good to have those on your radar radar and a resource because I promise you they will come up. So uh, the first one is 4.1.14, uh, clients with diminished capacity. Uh, th this comes up uh, in a couple of our cases uh, almost all, all the time, especially when you have people who um, have cancer or are dying of cancer. Um, and a lot of times at the end stage, they get to the point where they really can't make decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I'm going to have Patrick talk about kind of how we deal with it on the back end, but on the front end, I know the one thing we deal with uh, is, is, uh, is making sure we have some alternative contacts and finding out who's really close to that family member, who's actually taking care of them. Uh, those kind of things. So we have some, so, so we can protect our clients' interests and comply with our ethical duties when we're, when we're speaking to uh, someone else on the client's behalf, which often occurs to make sure we're speaking uh, to the right person. Um, Patrick, so what kind of issues do you see come up in this regard? 
Yeah, so a lot of times it's, uh, you know, uh, like the, the sister of, of, our, of our client wants to call with and, and get updated information because our client, you know, talked about it at Thanksgiving that she's in a, a you know, a litigation or something like that. And, you know, we have pretty strict rules in our office that, you know, unless you are on, on our list of clients, you know, we cannot speak with you. Um, if, if the client wants us to talk with the other family members, then we send them a quick, you know, uh, sign off that, you know, we, they, they give us authority to speak with them. Um, but, you know, there are, you know, at the end of the day, especially when you're we're dealing with decedents, uh, there are going to be family conflicts. And you know, we, we always are cognizant of making sure we're speaking with people who have the legal authority uh, under our contract and under the law to make decisions for them. That's you know, something that will come up, especially when you're talking about decedents. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, unfortunately, especially if it's a, a nice sum of money coming in, unfortunately, families who've got along for a long time uh, sometimes don't get along. So, you know, you got, uh, you know, and, and like I said, the client might not even be deceased yet and the problems can start. So just make, you know, make, make sure you're complying with your ethical duties on who you talk to and uh, that it's the right person. Um, so the next slide, um, uh, unauthorized practice of law, multi-jurisdictional practice of law. You know, I, I generally say it's pretty straightforward to comply. Um, you know, if, if you're litigating the case elsewhere, you got to get admitted pro hoc um, or in sometimes in the multi-district litigation consolidated proceedings that Patrick talked about. Um, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be procedures for getting admitted and filing cases in, their, in those federal courts because they recognize that there's going to be a lot of uh, out-state or non-barred members practicing in their court. Um, and, you know, you also, you know, we sign clients up from all over the country. And for instance, in Roundup, we have clients from all over the country, but they're filed, or most of our cases are filed here. Um, um, but so we still have to comply with those states' laws too when we're representing them, even though we have them filed here in Missouri. And so uh, the two cautions that I would give you that get people jammed up on this, um, in, in my opinion, is one, uh, your co-counsel can get you jammed up. Make sure that uh, if you're co-counseling with somebody that they're doing everything uh, that they're supposed to do in terms of uh, representing people who may not be in, in, in their state or their barred area uh, or barred state and also in such consolidated proceedings that they've done all the things because if your co-counsel, um, you know, as we know, you're on the hook for it too. Uh, secondly, with the vendors and I, you know, and like I said, there's some good ones out there and there's some that um, I wish did things a little bit differently, but sometimes some of these vendors as we go back to one of the early slides uh, about partnering and joint joint venture partners, a lot of these vendors, meaning for instance, an advertising company could be affiliated with a law firm. And sometimes, you know, there's deals and, and, and that made that involves not only that advertising company, but another law firm and, and how that's, uh, you have to make sure you're not sharing fees with non-lawyers. Um, you have to make sure uh, who this firm is you're working with. So there's just some kind of hidden nuances in there that, you know, when, when you're kind of pitched on, oh, let's get some cases or let's advertise and do this. Um, uh, you got to make sure that, you know, who you're working with and making sure that they're complying so that you don't get jammed up over something that you don't foresee, especially if, uh, you know, especially if maybe you're not doing every, some of the day-to-day -day work or, or getting them in through the pipeline and the procedures. Um, the last point, uh, this is uh, one of the banes of my existence, but thankfully Patrick has been kind enough to uh, deal with this on a couple of our cases lately, is uh, dual representation issues. So. Yeah, so this, this is something that can come up, uh, you know, if you have bad communications, and even if you have good communications, but you know, if you have a client that doesn't hear from you for a while, they think you're not working on their case, they're just gonna sign up with uh, somebody else and sign up another contract. Um, you know, if a, a mass tort starts, you'll start seeing advertisements on TV and, and you'll get people, even if you've been in contact with them, that for whatever reason, they just think, you know, the more contracts I sign, the, the more money I'm going to get. Um, obviously, that's not true and that just creates more problems. But um, 
in those scenarios, you'll have multiple firms with signed contracts and they have a legal interest in that person's case and in their, their claim. So uh, we do, we handle these. These are not uncommon. It's not something that's you know, earth shattering when they happen. It's just the nature of them because there's just so many claims out there and you just can't control what everybody is doing. Um, so how we do them is we reach out to the other firms that are representing them and the attorneys themselves uh, work out an agreement to say, we'll split the fee this way and we'll designate this firm uh, as the firm that's gonna keep the case from here um, and the attorneys will just split the fee. Um, but these have a tendency to come up once settlement discussions start talking. Um, and so it's just something that has to be resolved and it, it just is what it is. But um, if you get into mass torts, just know that uh, it's very, very important to tell your clients, do not sign up with anybody else. Uh, we are your attorneys and just to, again, to stay in contact with them to make sure they're not creating those types of issues. And, and not all of them are gonna listen to you. So. Right. <laughs> um, and, and, and to Patrick's point there is, you know, this crosses, uh, this kind of concept crosses not only because, you know, you have to get the client to sign off on this, uh, but it kind of crosses into your uh, ethical duties crossed with uh, kind of the practical way you have to do things. So, you know, we all have to be practical uh, from time to time, especially if you're representing a large volume of clients, but it doesn't mean you can shirk any of your uh, ethical duties and you owe each one of them in particular your own ethical duty uh, to that particular client. Even if you have 999 other ones who have the same or similar type of case, you still owe a ethical duty to that specific client, um, uh, which probably goes without saying, but uh, again, it's, you know, it's, it's just one of those things you keep on top of, uh, you probably won't have any issues. It's just, you know, it's sometimes people don't keep on top of these things and they can run into issues. So our next two slides, I'll kind of flip back and forth. There are rules 4.72, advertising, 4.73, direct contact with prospective clients. They kind of go hand in hand. Um, again, these these are, uh, you know, as with most, or as with all ethical rules, I suppose I should say, um, these are strict compliance. And um, uh, when you're advertising, you not only have to comply with your own personal states, uh, uh, advertising obligations, but if you're advertising in other states, you need to be aware of what they do and do not allow. Um, uh, certainly, it's, a lot of it, I think, has become somewhat uniform in my experience over the last, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years, but there certainly are some nuances, and advertising is one of those areas where there are some nuances. Um, for instance, maybe your disclaimer is different in some states than others. Uh, I know uh, Texas and Missouri have some different uh, things in that regard. And again, with your advertising, um, uh, you know, again, always be careful of who you're working with and always be careful with the vendors you choose to work with because, you know, they have a different business agenda than yours. Uh, from time to time and one of theirs is to get stuff out as quick as possible and one of yours is to make sure you don't violate any ethical rules. So um, just make sure you're on top of it, make sure you're reading the rules and make sure you're working with reputable people and some of that takes care of itself, but it doesn't always, I guess is my point. And um, you know, you, you're the one that's ultimately responsible for this. Uh, um, you know, on Patrick, anything to add there before I kind of, one other thing? No. Okay, great. Um, so, um, you know, in comment two, I raised because the bottom part of it says you're otherwise not permitted to pay another person for channeling professional work. Again, make sure you're doing everything the right way that you're not sharing fees with non-lawyers. These deals that you structure, uh, especially if it involves an advertising company and a non-lawyer are set up the right way because some of those, uh, I've seen some contracts and uh, uh, sometimes things get glossed over, uh, but make sure you're not uh, sharing fees with uh, a non-lawyer, very, which very, and you know, I know it seems obvious, but it inadvertently can happen. Um, and then on the last slide, um, even even if your form of advertisement is uh, allowed, for instance, some states allow certain types and not other types. Even if it's allowed, um, make sure it's still 
even if it's allowed, make sure it contains uh, proper information that's not false or misleading. There have been uh, some issues lately uh, in the last couple years on certain cases, and I'm not here to name cases or firms, um, where the ad was, it was close to the line on uh, maybe being a little bit, uh, having some false info or a little bit of hyperbole on it. And it was, I saw, I, you know, I saw it, I, Patrick and I talked about it. It was, it was very close to the line. I, I personally wouldn't have done it, but again, it, you know, that I perhaps on this ethical stuff err on the side of caution and would encourage you to do so. So um, wrapping up real quick, uh, there's no Emerald City. Um, you know, this, this stuff takes work and it doesn't, you don't just show up and, and make money uh, one day. And um, kind of the last piece real quick is one is a cautionary tale and one's a good tale. Um, it's projects on the horizon. Um, you know, a lot of people are looking at Zantac cases and it sounds great because the FDA pulled them. And that, the problem with that is uh, that drug's been on the market since the 80s. Um, uh, there's generic uh, sellers, there's multiple brand sellers, there's product ID issues. So it's one of those from the outset, seems great, but you need to really, really know what you're doing. And, and then kind of, uh, on the other hand, um, there was a lot of, on the roundup, I think there was a lot of misinformation at first on um, uh, what, in terms of saying that the product was safe. But over time, I think uh, some other information has come out and otherwise. So again, it goes kind of back to my point of things ebb and flow and various new things come up. And there's always, I always say opportunities are like buses. There's always another one around the corner. I mean, we're looking at coronavirus business litigation and some other projects. So I guess my point is, is to keep your eyes, um, you know, keep your eyes out there and, and, you know, be entrepreneurial and think about what's out there and think about what may be in your wheelhouse. So um, thank you uh, all for having us. Jen, do we have a minute for any questions or did we run out of time? We do have a minute. I just wanted to remind really fast, um, anyone who has any questions, any additional questions, there's only one right now, but if you have any, please use the Q&A link at the bottom. And those of you who have joined us by telephone, it looks like there's about five or six of you, please send an email to marketing at alaris.us so that we know that you were, that you joined us today. And Seth, you kind of just addressed uh, briefly, maybe you glossed over it on purpose. <laughs> uh, the question is, given the pandemic, what types of mass tort cases are you anticipating? If you could address that. Uh, yeah, I didn't gloss over it on purpose. I was just trying to be, uh, uh, you know, I think so far um, we have, at least can think of the perspective from how we look at things and we look at things from both a uh, practical perspective and a business perspective, because again, we do not get paid by the hour. Um, so far, I think there will be some other ones. I think um, there could be some other opportunities out there. Uh, the one thing that we're looking at right now is uh, business coverage uh, cases. And I think that because a lot of these insurance are going to be overlapped, there could be some mass and class type opportunities. Uh, we've got a lot of individual calls for restaurants and businesses. And basically the insurance company has taken the position of one, this was either blatantly excluded in terms of an actual virus, which I've seen was crazy that they would put that in there or the think to put that in there. Or number two, that the policy provides for only for physical damage. And, you know, and I've seen letters from brokers, I've seen uh, uh, different things kind of parlaying this out there, but I, but I think that there's some, uh, some opportunity there that these issues aren't as quite as clear cut, especially how some of these vexatious and bad faith laws, um, uh, you, you know, are interpreted out there. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there's some opportunities there, there may be some uh, some other type opportunities, perhaps cruise ship exposures, uh, things like that of where, you know, people perhaps didn't disclose uh, and were knowingly later uh, affected by, you know, perhaps larger entities or larger business entities. I mean, I guess my short answer is, is right now we're focusing on some insurance uh, vexatious uh, type cases for, for some local uh, restaurants and businesses, but I, I do think it's going to expand. It's just um, where we're going. Again, I don't think we all quite know yet. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So we have uh, run out of time. I did just try to type up that answer. I will send that to the group. Sorry if there's a typo in there. I was typing kind of fast, but 
Um, I appreciate you guys, your time very, very much. It was very interesting. I assume that you are willing to take calls or emails from folks that they have questions, uh, any of our attendees, uh, based on the information you provided today? Sure. Okay. Yep, absolutely, anytime. Okay, well thank you so much once again. And uh, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to email me uh, or send them uh, to my attention. And this will conclude the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, thanks.